Okay. So, um, and now I'll go ahead with introducing our first speaker. So Neige uh, Frankel uh, hails from France. Um, so she's originally from Toulouse uh, where she did her bachelor's in physics. But more recently uh, she worked in Lund and uh, just completed her PhD from Max Planck in Heidelberg. So congratulations Neige. And her uh, focus has been large data sets of stars and Milky Way, uh, focusing on the disk and its past evolution. Um, so Nish, if you'd like to go ahead, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, so thank you very much for having me here. I'm happy to tell you about my work on the Milky Way disk. And there are many reasons why we should be interested in the Milky Way. One is in order to understand the objects that the Milky Way contains, like its stars, its black holes, its planets, we need to understand the Milky Way as uh, it's their host. And the second reason is that it is a typical disk uh, galaxy. So for a galaxy evolution perspective, it's a very interesting system. It has a typical mass, a typical size. It has a bar and spiral arms. So the processes that shaped it likely shaped other disk galaxies. And what makes it special is that we are sitting inside it. And so we can see it star by star and see the processes that uh, shaped it from the inside. So one question that we can have about disk galaxies in a more global context is why are they so regular? For example, why do most disk galaxies have exponential profiles? Does this result from formation processes or from evolution processes. And in a different direction, if you take a picture of a disk galaxy in the UV, where the light traces the young stars, you see that it's very clumpy and very structured. Now, if you do the same exercise in the infrared, where the light traces the overall mass distribution, you see something that looks much smoother. <coughs> and the question is, how do you go from a clumpy star formation to a globally smooth profile for the galaxy? So one thing we know is that there is phase mixing. So stars mix in radius, uh, in azimuth, after a few dynamical time scales. And the question is, is there anything else? So now that we have these two questions, the exponential profile and the clumpiness of star formation, imagine if we had one galaxy to which we can ask, where were your stars born and where are your stars today? How much insight it would bring to these two questions? And this is what we're about to do now with the Milky Way. So we can take the Milky Way as a global model organism for formation and evolution of these galaxies. And for many of its individual stars, we know the 3D position, the 3D velocity, abundances and ages. And this puts us in a position to ask what processes set the structure of the Milky Way disk over the past six or seven giga years. And by processes, I mean that I'm going to show you a global scenario that I have of how the Milky Way disk could have formed and evolved and parameterize it and fit for the model parameters to interpret them. And the structure is going to be encoded in the data. Now we'll stay uh, well below Redshift 1 because the assumptions that we're going to make along the way will break uh, way before then. <coughs> so now the data that I'm uh, using is uh, 7,000 stars from uh, Apogee and Gaia surveys. For these stars, we have 3D positions, velocities, metallicity, and ages. And as you can see on the left-hand side on the artist impression, the blue dots represent my data and they, have, they cover a wide range of galactocentric radii. And this is very important if you want to capture global processes that shape the disk of the galaxy. And the yellow dot, it's us, it's the sun, and the previous data sets that were used with that much information for stars were smaller than the, the yellow dot. So this is really a great improvement from the data perspective. Now imagine with such a data set, we can start making um, easy plots just to understand if there is any, any sign of evolution in the data. So the first thing that we could do, for example, is to split this data set in two, look at the young stars and look at the old, old stars and see if there is a, any difference between the two of them. 
So for example, we can look at the metallicity profile of stars in the galactic disk. And for the young stars, you see that there is a tight relation between metallicity and radius. And also the inner disk of the galaxy is metal rich and the outer disk is metal poor. But overall, there is not much scatter. Now, if you do exactly the same exercise for stars that are older, you see the same relation, but it has a scatter. And the question is really, where does that scatter come from? If you think about uh, stars, their the abundances in their atmosphere do that doesn't change too much during their lifetime. So really, the only thing that can change on that plot is the x-axis. So the idea is that stars are born in a tight relation between metallicity and radius. And as time goes, stars can change orbit and change radius, and that scrambles this relation. Now, if you eyeball the size of my red arrows, you would find something like stars spread on a scale of 3 kiloparsec. And if you do better modeling, and really uh, try to measure how much stars spread in radius, you would find that it's 3.5 kiloparsec after 8 giga year. 8 giga year is about the, the age of the galactic disk. So after a lifetime, stars have spread by 3.5 kiloparsec. And um, 3.5 kiloparsec really it is the scale length of the galactic disk. So this is really large scale. But only knowing that stars spread a lot in radius, it doesn't tell us how stars change orbits. And really, there are many things that you can do to a star to change orbit. So how really do stars change orbit? If you think about a star that is born on a circular orbit, one thing that you can do to change the orbit is just changing the size, which means you change the angular momentum. Or you could change the shape which means the, you kick the star in velocity and it becomes eccentric. Now on that eccentric orbit, uh, it is difficult to describe it. It requires at least four numbers, the 2D position and the 2D velocity. And these two things change in time. So instead you could summarize this in a summary statistic that is the radial action. So this is really this uh, small equation. That is the integral of the velocity in the radial direction over the orbit. So now if your star you know, is on a circular orbit, the radial velocity is always zero. You only have tangential uh, velocity for rotation. And so JR, the radial action is zero. If your star is on an eccentric orbit, then this number will be positive. So that's all you need to know. If the star is on a circular orbit, this is zero, else it is positive. Now, the first process where you only change the size of the orbit is cold torquing, which means you go from a circular orbit to a different one. And changing the shape of the orbit is heating, so you increase the random motions of the stars. And that is really easy to do, so you know the star can just meet a spiral arm or meet a giant molecular cloud, and it gets a kick in velocity, and then it changes uh, eccentricity. But really changing the just the size of the orbit, you take it from a circular orbit to a different circular orbit, you need really a specific process that does that. And in 2002, Salgood and Vinay came with a solution for this question, that is the correlation resonance. So if you think about different structures in the galaxy and plot their velocity profile, you have the stars on a flat rotation curve, and then you could imagine a perturbation like a bar or, sp or spiral arms that rotate like a solid body. Where these two lines intersect, uh, the stars and the perturbation rotate at the same speed. So they're going to interact for a very long time. And this is where the effects are going to be strongest. Inside corrotation, stars rotate faster. And outside corrotation, stars are slower. And exactly at corrotation, I'm showing you a movie of what could happen. You have a star that is being pulled by a blue spiral arm in front of it that exerts a positive torque on the star. So the star gains angular momentum, moves outside, but since it's outside corrotation, it rotates slower than the spiral arms. So the spiral arm behind it is catching up, exerting a negative torque on the star. So right now it's easier to see on the right-hand side. The star loses angular momentum, moves inside corrotation, and starts rotating faster than the spiral arms. So now it's catching up on the spiral arm in front of it. Now, if this is the only process that happens, 
you just have a star that is trapped at the corrotation resonance. And that wouldn't explain the 3.5 kiloparsec that I just showed you before. So you need something else. And that something else is, uh, happens if the spirals are transient. If they come and go, they appear and disappear on random time scales, you have a star that only lives on a small portion of that horseshoe orbit until the next spiral comes. So that would become a stochastic process and star does a random walk in angular momentum. So now I'm going to do exactly the same exercise, but with many stars, not just one, to show you the effect it has when stars experience spiral arms, but at different phases. So we start with having all the stars exactly on the same orbit, and the only difference is the phase. And now also I'm going to show you what happens if the spiral arms are transient. So they come and go randomly. But that would make this a specific movie really messy. So we're going to do only one thing. We're going to follow the angular momentum of stars as a function of time. So we really take that setup and translate it to the space of angular momentum. So this is what you're going to see. On the left-hand side, you have the angular momentum distribution of the stars. Right now, we are at time zero, so they all have the same orbit. So this is a Dirac function. So you have uh, angular momentum and a Dirac function. On the right-hand side now, you have the x-axis is time. The y-axis is also angular momentum. All the stars are here at time zero together on the same orbit. And the background tells you when there is a spiral. So as you see, they come and go, they appear and disappear. When it's dark, there is a spiral. When it's white, there is no spiral. And I will come with the random speeds. So now I run it, and what you see is that the stars already from the first spiral, they start drifting in angular momentum in different directions. That's because they have different phases. And four giga years later, they all end up on a different orbit. And they have spread in angular momentum. So this is the random walk-like process that I'm describing. Now there is a problem. For the Milky Way, we cannot reproduce this experiment. And the reason is that we do not have an inventory of all the spiral arms that came and went. So we can really not do that. And all of these stars sort of conserved their circular orbits. So just from the kinematics, you cannot tell where they come from. So instead, we can use the fact that they keep memory of their birthplace from a chemistry point of view in the sense that we saw already that metal-rich star likely come from the inner disk of the galaxy, and metal-poor stars probably come from the outer disk, which you can disentangle now from the, the color on that plot. So now we have all the elements that we need to construct a model for the galactic disk. And to construct a model for the galactic disk, the first thing that you need is just to populate a, some, populate a disk of stars. So you need the star formation history and the birth profile. And I also make the assumptions that stars are born on near circular orbits. So that will give us the distribution of birth angular momenta and birth times or ages. So right now we have one star, two stars, three stars, many stars, and they are all born in different, at different radii in the disk. So now they all have different metallicities. So we saw already that young stars seem to have a tight relation between metallicity and radius, and we use it now. And this relation is parameterized with model parameters, and we are going to fit for them. So stars don't keep this uh, tight relation between metallicity and radius for long because the orbits evolve. So we saw there is cold torquing, so stars change from one circular orbit to the next, and that produces this scatter, and then it happens even more as time goes. And the other process is heating. So the orbits of stars uh, start becoming eccentric and a single orbit will occupy many radii, which adds up to the scatter. So now we want to disentangle that. One of the stars will be us, our, our sun, and some of the stars around it will be selected for observation in uh, our survey and they will end up in my catalog, which I showed you earlier. So you also need to incorporate that into the model if you want to do any fitting. Now that you have all elements, you can you know, take all of these probabilities and multiply them together. It gives you a likelihood function for your 
model parameters. So before we do the fitting and look at the model, best fit model parameters, I want to zoom in on the dynamics aspect of that uh, model to show you really what happens in the space of orbits. So we take angular momentum, for example, I have a simple diffusion model that says the PDF of stars broadens as a function of time. And the question is really that we ask the Milky Way, how much does it broaden with time, how fast? And I have a similar model for radial action here. So now if we go in the plane of orbit, so angular momentum and radial action to see what happens in 2D, as a recap, uh, a star that has a low angular momentum is located in the inner disk. A star that has a high angular momentum is more in the outer disk. A star that has a low radial action is on a circular orbit. A high radial action will be mostly eccentric. And the star that has no angular momentum, so it won't rotate, but some radial action will be on the radial orbit. So now with my model, let's say where are the stars born? I take one star, it will be on a Dirac function of angular momentum, which means it is somewhere in the disk, and it will be on a near circular orbit, so radial action is close to zero. And as time goes, that's what my model says, stars can spread in orbit space. And the question that we want to ask the Milky Way really is, how much do stars spread in angular momentum in the x-axis? So, you know, there is a strength, and a time dependence. And how much do they spread in radial action? How eccentric do the orbits become? And you have a strength and a time dependence. And what we want to do is to fit that for the Milky Way and really plot these two functions as a function of time. So I do it right now. So we start with angular momentum. At time zero, stars have not spread in angular momentum. They're still on their birth orbit. And six giga years later, they have spread by 600 kiloparsec kilometers per second. Now, if I translate that to a spatial scale, if you prefer, this would be for a rotation curve of about 200 kilometers per second. This would correspond to a scale length of spread of three kiloparsec. So here we recover the three kiloparsec that I told you already about in the introduction with the red arrows. So most of the diffusion in radius that we see can be already explained with a diffusion in angular momentum. Now, if I show you for radial action what happens, you see that the difference between the two of them is just a factor 10. So radial migration is dominated by angular momentum diffusion. And the reason why I can put these uh, two quantities on the same plot and compare them, it's really because they have the same units. It's uh, a distance times a velocity. So this can have important implications. Just the fact that the, the redistribution of stars in angular momentum is strong and cold. First, it can tell us that asymptotically, a strong diffusion process in angular momentum will maximize the angular momentum distribution, the entropy. And so it can lead disk profiles to exponentials. So if this process were to be universal to other disk galaxies, this could be one scenario why disk profiles are exponential. And the other question that we had was how come that uh, star formation is clumpy but disks look smooth? We know there is phase mixing and now we also know there is radial mixing. So you have a global um, process that just scrambles stars in all directions. So now we come to my conclusion. So first, the orbit evolution is cold, but it is far reaching. So you can see a star that is in a circular orbit today, but be born much further away. And the disk remains uh, really cold. So it, it's really rotationally supported. That can explain uh, processes that we see in other galaxies. But the reason why it is so good to do that with the Milky Way is because you have access to physical scatter because we have star by star information. And now the next step will be to really uh, investigate what are the drivers of this orbit evolution. So far, I just showed you um, a model that has no physics, that, that makes no assumption about the physics. 
but you see that there are strong processes and now we need to address what drives these processes. I've talked a lot about spiral arms and now the question is how strong are spiral arms in the Milky Way? So I will stop uh, here and um, thank you for your attention. Awesome, thank you so much, Nej. Uh, great talk. Um, it's time for the audience to ask questions. Uh, please use the raise your hand feature and I can call on you. Uh, in the meantime, I will ask uh, a question. So I wanted to ask, uh, how do you think, so you talked about spiral arms impacting the orbits of the stars in the disk. Do you have any thoughts on uh, interactions with satellites? Um, this is a work, I mean, I've worked on Sagittarius in the past, so of course I'm gonna ask about Sagittarius, which has come through the disk uh, on several occasions. Do you have any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I have a few thoughts. So indeed, uh, it, that, that could also be an important process, but um, satellites would affect mostly the vertical uh, velocities of the star, the vertical motions. And in order to really disentangle the process that happen in the midplane of the disk from um, those that could be caused by satellites, it would be better to look at the 3D motions of the stars. So here my model was very simple. It's all the stars are on a really uh, disk in two dimensions. So mm -hmm. adding the vertical dimension, like increasing, uh, in including um, vertical action into that model could uh, help doing that. Okay. Uh, thanks. Seems like we have a question from Jennifer. Yeah, I, I your simple model uh, showing how stars of different phases diffuse um, throughout uh, the galaxy made a lot of sense to me. But the thing, I was wondering if star formation is correlated with the locations of the spiral arms and they start out clumpy and not necessarily at different phases, does that affect that model or is, is that a simplification that doesn't actually matter in in detail in real life or? Oh, so it would matter, but only on the shortest time scales. So the, the, first, the first few dynamical time scales, you would see the effect that uh, the galactic disk is not phase mixed. The young stars are not phase mixed in the galactic disk. But for lo much longer time scale, like from one giga year on, on, the secular evolution of the galactic disk itself uh, would be more affected by uh, other processes than just having a star formation that is, uh, located where the spirals are. OK, great. Uh, David. Yeah, hi. This is a dumb question. Um, on this red curve here, uh, at each point in time, is there a thickness? Is there more than one point on that red? Right, yes. Uh, you mean this uh, brownish LZ yeah. curve? Yeah. yeah, so these are many curves because I wrote a likelihood function and then I sampled the posterior for my model parameters. So that each tiny curve is drawn from my posterior. Okay, got it, thank you. Okay, uh, Jennifer, do you, do you have another question or is that still your original hand raise? Oh no, I don't know how to like lower, there's no lower hand button. <laughs> I guess if I hit raise hand again, it works. All right, <laughs> no worries. Uh, any, Last questions for Nej before we move on? Okay, if not, um, so a reminder that Nej's schedule is available for meetings today and I'll uh, hand it off to Rob for our next speaker. Okay, thank you, Marian, And thanks Nej as well for the nice talk. Um, so our next speaker and last speaker for this semester actually is Cameron Mackey. Um, he's currently postdoc at Berkeley Lab, and some of you may, may remember he was a summer undergrad in the Hytran group in 2011. He did his PhD at Leiden University, um, where his thesis won two awards, one from the AAS and the other one from the American Chemical Society. Um, so apologies for the slight rearrange of order, but I will hand over to Cameron now. Um, Cameron, if you want to yep. start your presentation. There we go. Can you see okay? And can you hear me okay? Yeah. 
loud and clear. Okay. Good. We had some technical difficulties this morning, so hopefully my slides aren't too delayed when I when I switch them. But we'll see how it goes. Uh, yes. Thank you for the great introduction, Rob. Uh, my name is Cameron Mackey, um, and I'm currently a postdoc at Berkeley Labs. But today I'm going to give you a talk about the work I did at uh, Leiden University under the supervision of Xander Thielen's uh, Alessandra Candian and Tim Lee from NASA Ames. Uh, so my, my research was on the anharmonic infrared spectra of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. I'll just give you a brief outline of what I'll talk about today. Uh, first, we'll do a, a quick background on pause, what they are and why we care about them. Then we'll do a little theoretical background on uh, just what is involved with these anharmonic uh, infrared calculations. Uh, I'll show you some, some results, uh, then um, we'll talk about uh, adding some energy or temperature dependence into these, these calculated spectra. Then finally, we'll model some, uh, some actual real cascade uh, uh, PAW emission that you would see in the interstellar medium. So what is a PAW? Um, everything you need to know is in a name, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. Uh, they're hydrocarbons. They're polycyclic, so they're these, uh, these benzenoid rings joined together, and they're aromatic, so the, the electrons are, are uh, uh, delocalized over the surface of the, the molecules. Uh, and some chemists would be mad at me, but I also include kind of decorating these paws, adding side groups, even substitutions uh, into, into the paw as well. So why, why anharmonic infrared spectra of paws? Why do we care about that? Uh, well, let's break down that question uh, into multiple parts. The first being is why paws? Uh, well, paws are ubiquitous in space. They're basically seen in every single object uh, you look like you look at in the infrared, uh, from planetary nebula all the way, all the way to uh, infrared emissions from galaxies as a whole. It's estimated that 10 to 20% of the interstellar carbon is locked up in these paws. Uh, and these paws don't sit there uh, idly either. They have a strong interaction with the environment. They can uh, affect charge balance, uh, cooling rates, um, uh, grain formation, that sort of thing. And you can also turn that around and use them as tracers of local conditions if you understand the paws very well. So the next part of our question is why infrared? Uh, that one's easy. It's because that's all we see from the paws. Uh, there's been no detection of rotational uh, transitions of the paws or electronic transitions. Uh, some would say that uh, is, a, is a point against the pause, but, but uh, uh, we're still looking for those. Uh, but anyway, in the infrared, we have these, 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 these very prominent features, originally called the unidentified infrared bands, now called the aromatic infrared bands that are largely attributed to the, the pause, the pause family. Uh, and of course, these are vibrational uh, spectra, or the vibrational transitions, so they're not characteristic of an individual paw. Uh, but, but due to the local, uh, local uh, bonding nature uh, inside the molecule. So all paws have very similar uh, infrared spectra, but that's not to say that there's uh, variations due to structure, charge, protonation, deprotonation, and nitrogenation of the paws themselves. So you can still uh, work out uh, general trends from these infrared spectra. So why anharmonic then? Uh, well, we have new high resolution missions coming online, uh, hopefully soon. Uh, and it's been shown through experiment that the harmonic uh, infrared model is not good enough for modeling these paws. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, lines that are unaccounted for, and most of these lines are, are hypothesized or were hypothesized to be due to anharmonicity, so combination bands, overtones, hot bands, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and also now uh, the computational power is there to, to do these anharmonic uh, spectra because uh, before they were uh, just too intensive. So then the motivation behind this, this work becomes clear. Uh, astronomical PAW observations rely heavily on theoretical data. Uh, and uh, it's been shown that these, these harmonic spectra are not good enough, uh, especially in the three micron region and the five micron region, which I'll show in a minute. Uh, there's also this, this question of temperature dependence with the harmonic, you don't get any temperature dependence, uh, which affects the bandwidths and asymmetries. And the James Webb Space Telescope is just gonna magnify all of these issues. So before I get into uh, the more theory and background, I just wanna uh, start off with splashing some results. Uh, don't worry, the blue is not my results. So on the, the bottom is, is high resolution, low temperature gas phase uh, spectra of nine methyl anthracene in the three micron region. Uh, and on the top is the old harmonic way uh, of calculating the spectra. So you can see that there's, there's a definite band shift in position and there's a, a numerous uh, missing lines uh, in, in the weeds down below. Now, once you do anharmonic calculations, you can see that the, the band positions agree phenomenally, and you get, uh, again, now you start reproducing all of these, these missing features, which I'll talk about in a minute. And I can go uh, 
I can go back and, and forth so you can see just the improvement uh, between the two methods. Okay, now that I kind of showed what we're aiming towards, I'll just talk a little bit about the theoretical background, uh, what's involved. Uh, and to do that, I'm just going to compare and contrast harmonic versus anharmonic. Uh, on the left here, we have a harmonic potential for a diatomic. We all know symmetric in shape and the energy levels are all evenly spaced and you have no dissociation region. And you can model this, uh, this potential as basically as a, a pairwise interaction, uh, basically Hooke's law is what you're doing here, uh, pretending that the, the forces between the, the bonds are just springs, perfect springs. However, uh, as we all know, the, the real potential of a diatomic molecule would look more like this with the dissociation region on the right. Uh, and now it's asymmetric in shape and all your energy levels are no longer evenly spaced. So if you wanted to write down uh, the full equation for, for, for this potential here, you could write it as an infinite Taylor series. Uh, but for, for my work, uh, what we do is uh, we just retain the first three terms of this uh, Taylor expansion. Uh, the first term being the same harmonic term. Then you end up with a cubic term and a quartic term. And these cubic and quartic force constants are used in a second order vibrational perturbation theory. So we solve the harmonic and then we, we perturb the system. This uh, table here just summarizes the difference between the two. Uh, for the harmonic, of course, your, your transitions are just your 3n minus 6 uh, uh, vibrational modes. Uh, for anharmonic, though, a little bit more complex. Again, you have your vibrational modes, but you have this first term here. Uh, this is your first anharmonic correction. Uh, these chi values, actually all chi values tend to be negative. Uh, so this is like the relaxation of your potential uh, slightly. So that's the kind of uh, uh, this relaxation due to the asymmetry here. And then your, your next term here uh, uh, depends on the quanta, not just in the vibrational mode itself, but the number of uh, vibrational quanta and all the other vibrational modes. So all of your vibrational modes are all now coupled to one another. And that, uh, that accounts also for the uneven spacing of your, uh, your, uh, your vibrational levels. Uh, so for the, the harmonic, again, you need a scaling factor, kind of bring it in line with experiment. And harmonic, you have no scaling factor required. Uh, for harmonic, you don't have any combination bands, overtones, hot bands, or resonances. With the harmonic or and harmonic, you can start accounting for all of these. And as a result, for harmonic, you have to use artificial bandwidths and no temperature dependence. But anharmonic, you can start to get sort of these real temperature band uh, uh, bandwidths and uh, temperature dependence. Of course, that all comes at a cost. Harmonic calculations take minutes to hours for very large species. Uh, anharmonic takes hours to weeks to months for medium to small species. So it's it's a lot more expensive. Uh, now, resonances, I touched on that very briefly back here. Uh, they're so important for pause that I just dedicated a slide to them. Uh, so what happens in a resonance is when you have two of your uh, harmonic modes uh, that fall very close to each other in energy, uh, what they'll do when you account for these, these resonances is they push each other apart slightly in band position to lift the, the near degeneracy. And you can actually have intensity borrowing between the two vibrational modes. So this guy here could actually have zero intensity in your harmonic model, uh, but after resonating with, with a neighboring feature, it can, can steal or borrow uh, significant intensity. And the reason these are so important with the pause uh, is that you have a large number of vibrational modes around 1500 wave numbers and a large number of modes around 3000 wave numbers. And these two 1500 wave numbers pair up to sum up to the approximate energy of the one other the 3000 wave number vibrational mode and uh, resonate through what we call a type two Fermi resonance. And there's so many resonances going on at the same time in a pod that you kind of have to uh, treat it as an eigenvalue problem. Uh, once you solve the, the, the eigenvalues give you your new band position. So that's the pushing and pulling of all of the, the different modes. And then the square of the eigenvectors give you how the, uh, the intensity gets redistributed over the resonances. So I go back to the, the first slide I showed of the results. Again, this is harmonic on the top. But now I've just kind of uh, shifted this, the spectra so it aligns with the features a little bit more. And then again, and harmonic. Uh, now you see all of, these, all of these little modes down here, even this big guy here uh, that's completely missing, are all due to resonances. So the intensity uh, borrowing from the, the stronger features. So you can just see how important these, these resonances are for the, the pause. Uh, this slide just summarizes all the methods we used. Uh, if anyone's interested, uh, we use Gaussian for our, for our quartic force field. So that's to get these, these anharmonic uh, constants. Uh, but then we moved over a second program called uh, Spectro to do our, our vibrational perturbation theory, just because it gave us more control uh, over uh, how we handle our resonances. 
so we, we did actually a series of three papers. We did uh, started off with some some very simple linear uh, pause, then we moved on to some nonlinear ones, and then finally we looked at uh, sort of these decorated hydrogenated and methylated pause. Uh, here's just a kind of a summary of those those species. So all very small, uh, too small actually for for space, but are interstellar in the interstellar medium. But uh, uh, we had to start somewhere. So I'll just show some more results. I'm going to do the same trick because I always love comparing it to the old way of doing things. So on the top uh, again is the harmonic. We have phenanthrene, cryzine, dihydrophenanthrene, and tetrahydronaphthalene here. Uh, and on the bottom uh, for each one is the high resolution gas phase spectra. Uh, and then you can see once we account for anharmonicities, just everything becomes beautiful. And uh, the match between the two is quite phenomenal. And I can go back and forth uh, to, to just show the, the dramatic change. Uh, we also did more than just the, the three micron region. We looked across the whole range and we compared to matrix isolation spectra. Um, this here is the five to six micron region. Uh, on, again, on the bottom uh, is, is some examples of some uh, uh, experimental spectra. And on the top is harmonic. And you can see that it doesn't do such a great job here uh, at all. Uh, account for anharmonicities. And you can see that the, the, the agreement becomes phenomenal. Uh, and I can go back and forth uh, between those two as well if you, if you didn't catch the improvement. Uh, so all of these modes here are actually due to uh, combination bands. So modes pairing up uh, with one another. Uh, so we, we actually get uh, quite phenomenal agreement uh, in our band positions. Uh, we did line identifications for all of these, these features, uh, which was a little bit difficult because uh, of the resonances, uh, but that's all summarized in the papers. Uh, so if from that body of work, we indeed concluded that uh, anharmonic uh, calculations are, are, are crucial for reproducing the spectra of pause, uh, especially in the three to five micron region. Uh, and Fermi resonances definitely uh, uh, play a strong role. So now we're ready uh, to uh, start incorporating um, some some um, more modeling into this. So uh, temperature dependence of these these spectra, and then start modeling uh, what what a, a, a ca infrared cascade of these pause would look like in the interstellar medium. So just a, a little background on on how these interstellar pause behave. Uh, so you can picture a paw sitting there for, for anywhere for one to two years, uh, completely cool, um, not emitting anything, and then it gets smacked with a UV photon, um, and it, it gets uh, electronically excited. Then uh, near instantaneously, uh, in a matter of, uh, I think, tens of uh, uh, picoseconds, it drops down to its electronic ground state. Uh, through an inter, uh, but does not emit uh, uh, a UV photon. Instead, it dumps all of its energy into its vibrational mode. So there's an intersystem crossing here. Uh, so now, almost instantaneously, this paw becomes uh, very uh, vibrationally hot. Uh, and then, over the next uh, relatively long period, tens of nanoseconds. It, uh, it slowly emits uh, these infrared photons. And every time it emits an infrared photon, uh, it cools slightly. Uh, and that changes the anharmonicity or the, uh, the coupling between the modes as the paw cools. Uh, so I'll show that in a minute. So it's a very, very non-thermal equilibrium process. So how do we model that then? Uh, well, first we can, we can, we can estimate the, the absorption uh, or the, the probability of absorption of a UV photon uh, by taking the black body of the star and multiplying it by the, uh, the absorption cross-section of the, the, the given paw. Uh, we assume all of that energy gets dumped into the vibrational modes then. So then uh, to, 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 uh, to, to choose a photon then to emit an infrared photon, we, we have a lookup table here. Basically, we look up a spectrum at a given uh, internal energy, emit a photon from that uh, 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 a spectrum, which then cools the paw slightly, uh, which then we choose a new uh, uh, infrared photon to emit from that new uh, temperature until the paw uh, cools down completely. Uh, and then uh, we kick another UV photon into it and re repeat this process of uh, emitting, uh, sort of cascading down uh, the energy of the, the paw. So uh, this just is the same thing I showed in that table in the beginning. Uh, basically, the vibrational energy uh, is given uh, by this equation here, which we get from uh, perturbation theory. Uh, and then the tra infrared transitions are given by, by this equation here. So we have our harmonic positions. 
the uh, first two are the anharmonic correction, and then we have a, a, our uh, uh, sort of our energy dependence. So the number of quanta and all the other vibrational modes uh, affect the, the band position. Uh, and then these chi values are the anharmonic constants and they tend to be negative. So in order to calculate these, these temperature or energy dependent spectra, we do a, a, a Wang-Landau walk, which is just a biased Monte Carlo walk over the, over the energies. Uh, so first we collect our, our density of states uh, with one walk, then we perform a second walk. And in that second walk, uh, where we randomly alter the number of uh, quanta in all the vibrational modes, uh, we generate an energy dependent spectra. So we take a snapshot uh, at every energy that we visit and, and tally those up. So here's just a uh, temperature dependence uh, spectra of anthracene, uh, 100 Kelvin, uh, 500 Kelvin, and 900 Kelvin. And these, these bandwidths you see here are not uh, convolved in any way. These are just purely from the, the, the calculation. And you can also see there's a, a shifting in peak position, which is, which is also uh, is interesting, which you don't really capture with, with a harmonic uh, calculation. So now that we have uh, sort of these uh, temperature dependent or energy dependent spectra, we can do a full full cascade. So simulate uh, what what this paw would, the profile of the, the features of these paws would look like. So I just have here the 11.2 micron feature of, I think this is anthracene. Um, and um, so in the black is the kind of the final cascade profile that you see. And then in these different colors here, are the different uh, emissions at different times or, or different energies. So when the, the paw has, is, is 12 EV, so it's, it's very highly excited or, or hot, it's emitting somewhere from, from this uh, a probability here. And as the paw cools, uh, the probability uh, narrows and approaches, this is the, the zero Kelvin position of the line. Uh, so you end up with these very uh, uh, steep uh, blue wings and these very long uh, uh, red, uh, tails. So it's very asymmetric in profile. Uh, then when you, you put that all together and start doing some, some, some modeling of uh, different stellar temperatures. Uh, so this is uh, the, the, the black body temperature of the star and you can see how the, the, the sort of the, the profile of the, uh, the pause change with uh, different, uh, different, in different environments. And now one would maybe naively see that the peak position is, is changing, uh, but that's not changing in the same way that it would change in the thermal equilibrium sense. Uh, what, 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 what that's due to is kind of these pseudo shifts. So if you have an isolated feature, your peak position doesn't change. But if you have a congested region here, you can see that it appears that your peak position is changing. So the blue one here looks like it peaks here and the, maybe the brown curve peaks over here. But what that, what's really happening is, is these long tails from the, the neighboring features are, are slipping under their, their lower energy neighbors, kind of boosting them up. So it's kind of propping up uh, the, the lower energy features, making it look like your peak positions are, are shifting, but really it's just elevating the, these, these peak positions above, above these peak positions, if that makes sense. So that was very interesting. Uh, now, now we just submitted this this uh, this paper uh, a few weeks ago, uh, where we kind of dissect the 11.2 micron feature of of the pause, uh, and we found that the profile is affected by by many uh, many uh, properties. The initial energy absorbed has has an effect on the profile, the size of the paw through through many uh, properties, such as the density of states. Uh, the 3.3 to 11.2 uh, uh, micron ratio. So smaller paws tend to emit. Uh, more in the 3.3 than larger paws. Uh, so that has an effect. Uh, also rotational temperature has an effect on the profile and, and neighboring features. So I'll just give you a, a, a kind of a preview of this unpublished work um, uh, and what we looked at. So this, this slide here kind of shows the ener initial energy absorbed. So we have the same feature, but in the purple here is if it absorbed 8 EV and then cascaded down uh, and then 7 EV, 6 EV, all the way down to if it absorbed 1 EV. Uh, and, uh, and cascaded down. So we can see here that the, the extent of the, the red wing is affected by the initial uh, absorbed UV photon, but the, the blue wing is, is rather static. The, the high energy uh, side kind of hovers around the zero Kelvin position. 
another another thing that affects the the another property that affects the uh, the, the profile is the 3.3 to 11.2 uh, intensity ratio. Uh, as I said, uh, smaller paws have a higher 3.3 uh, intensity than the 11.2, and that that goes to zero basically as you go uh, very large. So what I model here in the black is if the the the, the 3.3 micron uh, Pro, uh, emission is zero, has a zero intensity, and then I uh, increase the intensity relative to the 11.2. Uh, and you can see that the profile goes from a nice con, uh, uh, vex, sorry, a convex shape to a concave shape. Uh, and what's happening then at, at higher emission, all of the, all of the, uh, the intensity is being kind of cannibalized by the three micron region. So it's, it's stealing, well, not stealing, but it's, it's more likely you're emitting in the, the, the three micron region uh, in this region here at high energies. Then when you go down to low energies, then the 11.2 starts to dominate again uh, and gives you this characteristic shape. Uh, we also modeled rotational temperature and how that affected uh, the profile. Uh, we found that the only way that we could affect the, the, the blue edge of the, the profile was with rotational temperature. Um, no other no other property affected that, which we found was interesting. Uh, and what we found as well is that it, it starts to uh, eat away at the the blue edge, and until you get to point about the shoulder here, then your your peak position kind of remains constant. So this this plot here uh, is showing how the uh, the peak position is is changing uh, as a function of uh, uh, rotational half width, half max. Uh, so it it, it uh, kind of plateaus. And this is interesting because that's what astronomers see and no one's been really able to explain why there's a variation between peak position that's, that's very small between objects, but then also stops and no longer varies uh, between the two. Uh, so that was, that was an interesting aspect as well. And of course, with this information, we can do some, some fits to observations. Uh, I'll caution you that this is a very artificial fit. It's done with anthracene. Uh, which is way too small to be in the 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 interstellar medium, and uh, I, I kind of uh, fudged a, a few factors here to make it uh, so that the the anthracene, which is only uh, how many fourteen carbons, I think, it, I, I altered things so it's it's maybe four or five times as large uh, by changing uh, some properties. But the important thing is is that uh, so in the 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 blue here is the. Uh, anthracene cascade spectrum, and then the black is an observation from uh, the H2 region of uh, the Orion bar. And what's what's great about this is that we're showing that the, the whole profile uh, can be fit with just uh, uh, a few parameters, uh, basically that are only dependent on the size of the paw and the initial uh, UV photon absorbed. And the reason why this is so great is because normally with the harmonic models, people take hundreds of paws um, and uh, convolve those with Gaussian uh, profiles. And they fit this feature with, with like 50 to 100 different species. And we're showing here that no, you can just do, you can just fit this, this asymmetric profile with one, one species uh, if you take these anharmonicities into account. Uh, so that might, uh, that might have a, a bit of a paradigm shift there if we can uh, uh, go bigger than anthracene and really show this. So then the overall conclusions uh, from, from this, this work is that anharmonicities indeed uh, are needed to account for in order to reduce the infrared spectra of paws. Uh, and then maybe this, this paw cascade emission spectra has been misinterpreted uh, uh, until now. Of course, we want to go to larger paws uh, and look at general trends because as you go larger, the number of paws literally explodes. You can have hundreds of thousands of different species, but you wanna just maybe model the general trends. And uh, we hope to be ready for the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, that's if the uh, James Webb Space Telescope will be ready for us. And uh, I'd like to thank you for, for, for your time and uh, of course, all my collaborators and uh, the funding sources. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, so um, very nice talk, very nice talk. Um, so I, as mentioned, um, if you wanna ask a question, if you just use the raise hand feature in Zoom, I see we've already got a couple coming in, so I will um, hand over to Giovanni, if you want to unmute the microphone. Okay, um, a beautiful talk. Uh, that was really nice. Uh, let me ask this question. Um, given uh, an infrared observation of a, of a paw line and a shape, and they say <clears throat> the star farming region, is there a unique set of uh, information you can get about its environment from that, or is there too many degeneracies uh, if you try to uncover what caused that shape? 
Yeah, the, the biggest degeneracy I'm seeing is there's a degeneracy between the size of the paw and the initial uh, energy absorbed. So like I do here, actually here, this perfect slide, because I can, I can get anthracene to look like a larger paw by, by lowering the, the uh, UV photon it absorbs. So I think here, here I make it absorb four EV UV photon, uh, where really in the Orion bar, I think it'd be around uh, somewhere between eight and 10 EV. So if you can get, if you can get information from uh, uh, another, by another means, and then feed that into the model of the paw, that can, that can constrain that sort of degeneracy. But just from the paw feature alone, you can't really untangle those two. Okay, okay, great, thanks. Okay, and we, we also have another question from um, Gary Melnick. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, very nice talk, uh, I'd like to echo what Giovanni said. I, I'm wondering if you've looked at um, uh, isotopologues of particularly hydrogen uh, and your predictions for uh, the line centers and line shapes. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, people have hypothesized that uh, uh, a non-negligible amount of deuterium may be hiding in paws. And yes. so I'm wondering whether you have a diagnostic that could test that. Actually, uh, well, in the lab, sure. Uh, in, in observations, uh, it'd be a little bit difficult, but I can, I can tell you that these Fermi resonances are, are very dependent on, on uh, sort of isotopologues. So if you, if, you, if you add a bunch of deuterium in, you of course shift the, um, so sorry, maybe I'll go back a little bit here. What if I talk about resonances? I don't know, um, but uh, here we go. So you have these these sort of uh, these 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 modes that are resonating with one another. If you start playing around with the isotopologues, you shift the energy of, of these features uh, so they no longer resonate with the, the 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 CH stretching modes. So these are the CH bending modes, and these are the CH stretching modes. So you start kind of uh, breaking up the, uh, the the resonances, and that that dramatically alters, uh, of course, this region here because your resonances no longer occur. Uh, so of course, yes, that would, that would be a way that you could actually, that's how they, they did some, our experimentalists, uh, did some work in the lab to show that these were resonances was they were playing with isotopologues, but whether or not you could back anything out from observations, probably not. Things are too, too, well, I don't know, James Webb Space Telescope, maybe, uh, you'll have some high resolution, but I don't know if you'll be able to really see, uh, those effects in these very broad features. Thank you. No problem. Okay, and we have one more from Stephen Wilner. Yes, hi, thanks. This is great stuff. I'm very impressed. Um, I'm wondering though, I'm, I'm not a chemist, and so I'm a little uh, unsure exactly what you're doing. You're fitting the chi factors to the laboratory spectra. Is that the idea? Do you mean with our with our theoretical calculation? Yeah, where where are the chi's coming from? Oh, the chi's. Sorry, that's from a second order vibrational perturbation theory, uh, and we get that from. Uh, let me go back. So maybe I went over it a little too fast. So that's calculated through these these force constants here. So these can be these can be numerically calculated from uh, using your uh, your. Uh, we use Gaussian software package to do that. So these these force constants between the so these are the. What are these? These are the, the, the change in uh, force with respect to displacement of the atoms. So okay. you, can, you can numerically calculate these and then through a, a vibrational perturbation theory, you can get your chi's. Uh, and then that's how- Essentially you... first principles calculations. Yes, that's correct. And does that, do the chi's then imply the potential or, or do you start with the potential? And... Uh, well, okay, we start with potential. So what the chi's are doing are, are kind of correcting I guess, in a sense, uh, if you're doing, say, an overtone, it would it would account for the the uneven spacing of your vibrational uh, uh, levels. Thanks very much. Yeah, this is great. I'm I'm very impressed. Thanks. Okay, given the time, I think um, we should uh, leave it there. And I'll just point out that um, there are um, slots available for the one to one um, sessions. So please feel free to sign up for those. And with that, that brings us to um, the last or the, the close of the, the session for this summer, this semester, and we will be doing more um, in the spring. So look out for those. And thank you again to the speakers.
Thank you and thank you, Rob. Okay, I think Marion, do you want to stop recording?